called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in the jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gam Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed them, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him, and he was killed. All these followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt, and he too was killed, and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For it's their purpose or activity, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it'll fail. But if it's from God, you'll not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against the God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them fall. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is Christ. What a cool story. A lot of verses, and I'm telling you, it applies to us today just like it did to Peter and John then and the new congregation. Leaders, I want us to grab a hold of, are influential. And those of us that are leaders in the room, whether you lead at work or you lead here at church, wherever you may lead, I want you to know that you're influential. And your influence makes a big difference on people. And your influence can be good or it can be bad. I think about all... The, the singers, Karen and I really enjoy sitting down at night and, and watching America's Got Talent and the voice, those kinds of things, and listening to people sing and use God's gifting that they've been blessed with. It's really neat to listen to that. But we're responsible 
to use our gifting to the glory and the honor of God. And I think here they are singing these nasty metallic songs and, and they're in these, these rated movies and stuff. Do you know how powerful those people could be if they were doing it for Jesus? They're influential. Do you know how a Christian president could influence the world with his Christianity if he just had the courage and the, the boldness to do it? We are responsible. People watch us. When we're the light in a dark place, do we stand out? And we're responsible to the people we're leading. We're influential. These guys that they're talking to have killed Jesus, and there's conviction in their heart. They're scared. They're filled with fear that these guys are bringing thousands in the name of Jesus, and pretty soon we're going to be powerless, and they're going to overtake us. I had a woman ask me yesterday, hey, man. Do you feel okay being here with all these women? I said, sweetheart, I'm in Jesus deep enough. I don't care what 11,000 women think. And that's the way it was. I'm serious. I sat right there and grew in the Lord and praised with 11,000 women. Didn't buy any bit. There's now no male nor female, no Jew nor Gentile. We're all about in Christ. And we can enjoy the gifting, the blessings of Jesus, just like the other person beside us on our right or our left. And these guys are threatened. And when they get threatened, fear sets in. And when fear sets in, they start looking at Peter and John and these new Christians and get jealous. It says they got jealous, all of them. And you know, that high priest had the position, the authority, the power to stand in there and say, listen, guys, we got God in our lives. We don't need to worry about what these people are doing. And he bowed to the jealousy and the fear, and it took him over. We got to be careful as leaders not to bow to that mess. Conviction causes us to draw, draw close or distance ourselves. One of the two. And I already mentioned Adam and Eve in the garden. When they sinned, what was the first thing they went and did? Yelled out. They hid. They withdrew, didn't they? We can't withdraw. We have to be bold. Fear sets in and causes jealousy. And jealousy is an emotion. And when jealousy turns into an action, it's a serious problem. All our sin is. A sin can enter our mind and until we birth a sin or birth that action to do it, it's only in thought. But boy, when we work it out, it is a problem. And that's where these guys are at. All they've got to do is change and listen a little bit and be strong in their God that they honor and praise. But see, they don't have Jesus. Jesus is the missing link to all the faith in all the world. Or nations, I should say. One world. And when we don't have Jesus, then we've got a worldly mindset of it. And that's what takes over, is fear and jealousy. That's why we fight with nations and we strive against one another. The jealousy reaction comes in all forms. And it could be anger. <coughs> How many of us would, can look back at our dating years and, and remember being jealous over a girl we were dating and some other guy was looking at her and man, you want to pull his life out. And then we got mad and tried to punch his lights out and punch mine out instead. 
Jealousy is no good. Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, it burrs all kinds of sins. There's only one in this universe that can get jealous, and who's that? God. Amen. He's a jealous God. He will not share you or me with a Chevy truck, a brand new house, playing golf, fishing in a bass boat that we couldn't afford. He's not sharing us with that stuff. He wants us first. He's a jealous God. God is the only one that can be jealous. Peter and John are in bondage because of this jealousy. What do they do? Lock them up. And when we entertain jealousy, when we get into the anger, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the unloving spirit, then we're in bondage. Just like we get locked in jail. And we need to be set free. Our God sets us free from bondage. In verse 19, I love it. Uh, you have, see the first word, but. A three-letter word, and man, when that's in Scripture, something cool is coming. It's really coming. But, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. I want you guys and gals to get deep in your heart that when you're in bondage, there's one that will set you free. And it's not so dark. It can't happen. The door's not locked tight enough that it can't be unlocked. God's got an angel just waiting on you. And he'll come and unlock the door. He'll break the yokes that have you bound. He'll break the chains that have you hooked to a, to a sin or, or bondage that you don't want to be hooked to. We have freedom in Christ Jesus. And no matter how tough, how rough it gets, we can and will be set free if we focus on God Almighty, Maker and Creator. But God's provision in trouble always comes when we have a dark place. I was thinking of Psalm 46.1. I think Pat's got that up there. I didn't write it down or I didn't read it. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Don't ever get yourself back in a corner and think you're alone. God is an ever-present help. He's there constantly. All we have to do is call on His name. We're not limited in power or circumstance, and neither is God. But boy, it's so easy, is it not, to try and do things in our own strength. Being set free causes response. We have to do something with God's favor. If God blesses us and wants to use us, He sets us free so we can accomplish the work He's called us to. And if He sets us free, the next thing we know, if we don't use that freedom to, to minister His Word, we're in bondage again. He saves us to serve. Verse 20. After the door is unlocked, he says, Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. Every one of us in the room have a new life if we have Christ Jesus in our life, a new life. Our God is a jealous God. He wants our testimony, and he sets us free to serve. We can't just be set free and set back and get on cruise control. We have a responsibility to do the commands of the Lord. There's places to serve at destiny, and the closer we get to growing, the more places there are to serve. 
I just I mentioned Roger's ministry there that he has. We need people to step up and clean. We, we need people to, to step into places so you don't have to do it every other week. You can do it every fourth or fifth week. And as we get into the bigger building, there are going to be more opportunities to serve and bless God with your, your gifting He's given you. And we've got so many positions to fill, places to serve. Morning comes, and they preach the truth. I love it. The fourth watch, Jesus would always get together, and they would pray from 3 to 6 in the morning. And then when 6 o'clock came, when dawn broke out, they were teaching and preaching, ready to go. Filled with the Spirit, they heard from the Lord, and they were able to do anything God called them to do. Pretty cool stuff. Now, a lot of us couldn't get up at 3 in the morning. But you can do it at 10, or 12, or 7 at night. Spend time with God so you know what He's wanting you to do, what He's calling you to the religious can't figure it out. They don't know what's going on. What do you mean the doors are open? We locked them up. The guards are still standing there? Did the goofy guards let them out? What happened? Has God ever done anything in your life and you said, what happened? Boy, he has me. 1 Corinthians 1.27 God uses the simple things to confound the wise. He, he, he did that just so these guys would know there's a God Almighty. And these guys have the power of God all over them. And you better be careful how you're treating God's men. And we need to remember that in the body of Christ with our leaders and special people that have really been called by God, don't slap them in the face. Serious thing. God's word will always reach his people, no matter what. His word will never return void. And while preaching, Peter and John are asked to come with the Sanhedrin. They're just up here talking like, like I am with you, and all of a sudden they come marching in, and say, Mike, come with me. We got to talk. So I'd ask Mark to take over, and Mark come up here and start preaching and teaching, and I'd go out there with those rascals in the park and I'd talk to them. And you know what he did? Instead of getting bent out of shape and pointing his finger back at him and saying, you got no reason to be pulling me out. All I was doing was preaching and teaching Jesus. You know what he did? He started preaching and teaching Jesus to him again. How powerful. See, there's nothing that will set you or me free other than the truth, the Word of God. Nothing. And Peter's bold enough to stand right there and let him have it. I love the words. preaching the word of Jesus. There's nothing like the word of Jesus. We were told in Bible college, if you ever get asked to step up and fill something quick, and you don't know what to preach, preach Jesus. He's the truth, the way, the life, and everybody in front of you needs to hear it. And Peter and John tell these guys that you killed him. It was you that killed him. The Savior. The one that gave new life. You did it. And he came for, for uh, uh, Jerusalem. 
for Israel. And you guys are Israel. You're Jewish. You're the chosen people. And you ought to be getting us. But you don't get it. We got it. We know Jesus. And we're going to preach and teach him. Come hell or high water. It don't matter. And I think that's cool. Only Peter could do that. The crowd that killed Jesus can kill them. And these guys are worried about the crowds. So they go out and just say, Peter, come with us. Real, real quiet and careful, okay? He knows that the very crowd that's out there listening to Peter and John is the crowd that turned on Jesus in order to be killed. And they don't want to have the same thing happen to them. Pretty serious stuff. They're scared. Fear is taking them over. And I want us to remember, we're the crowd, we're the body of Christ that people are paying attention to. And we can't get into that spirit of hate and fear and jealousy. We have to be in love. God is love, and we are His family, His body of believers. The word makes us guilty of disobedience. These guys are so guilty that they killed Jesus for no reason. And they're guilty. And when we get guilty, when we get convicted and let condemnation set in, then we start doing bad stuff. Hurting people and doing totally opposite of what God does. And that is not good. The Sanhedrin are convicted of shedding Jesus' blood. And Peter states a Christian value that could never be forgotten. And I want us to take this home with us today. We obey God rather than men. And we're in a culture, in a society, that we worry more about what man thinks and says than what God does. And oh my God, do we have to get away from that, people. We have to get God first in our lives again. If my people will humble themselves and pray, I'll heal their land. We've got to get healthy. They're trying to silence Peter and John, and they preach the truth to them again. Verses 30, 33. Pat, you got them up there? I just love it. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of the sins to Israel. And he's telling them, you guys are Israel. This guy you killed is the one that can give you forgiveness and repentance. Listen to what we're preaching and teaching, people. He's talking bold to them like that. We're witnesses of these things. You know what? This is not a pipe dream. I'm not thinking this up. I'm, I'm not lying to you. We stood there and watched this Jesus do this stuff. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. Is it not the truth that sets us free? It only sets us free if we want to be free. They didn't want to be free. They were so closed-minded and their ears were closed, their eyes couldn't see who Jesus was, just like those disciples were several weeks before that. And we get so hurt, so upset, when we want a friend or a brother or sister or a mom or dad to come to Jesus, and they get furious with us. They don't have Jesus. Why would they get any other way? The love of God can only come from God. And when we're filled with an evil spirit, an unloving heart, that's what comes out. We get furious. So when people really get furious with you, stop and think, Lord, bless them with your son. 
fill their hearts with the spirit, your spirit so they change from the inside out. Peter and John are bold. They're furious. Don't become furious at God's word. It's easy for us to get mad when things aren't going our way, but God's got a bigger and better way. Don't get furious at him. Don't become furious at God's conviction. Let it change your heart. There are times people get nasty in my face. They get in my face. And I've got to stall and, and just wait a minute and say, Lord, do I need to be hearing this? If I do, i got to change. And if it's not for me, just let it roll off my back. And it's hard. But you got to do that. It's a choice. It's intentional. You renew your mind that very instant. And you don't go there because you have the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit within you. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You don't have to take it. You can let it roll off and go on and be about the Father's business. We have no one to please but God. And if we go into anger, if we get furious, there's death to follow. We will die. Without the truth, we become deeper in bondage. Without conviction, we become more sinful. We become more sinful there's no salvation. We're responsible to go and sin no more. And if we don't do that, if we live in a willful sin, then there's going to be a consequence to follow. And it says, but God. He's got another influential man standing in the background just waiting. He's got an angel waiting, and then he's got this guy waiting a Pharisee, and the people honor him. They love him. They trust him. They know they can listen to him and not be led astray. And I want us all to know how important it is to maintain our honor with people. If you're in a job and you're leaving to go for a new one, leave with a good report. You might have to go back to that job someday. <coughs> If you're moving out of an area and you've, you've slapped somebody in the face really hard, go tell them I'm sorry before you leave. Clean the air before you leave. Honor is so important. And when it comes to our, our faith, character and integrity will take you everywhere because that's who God is. He never fails. He never lets us down. And he never forsakes. Amen. Don't burn your bridges. He says, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. And I'm thinking of our scripture that we adopted for 2014. Give careful thought to your ways, boys. Because this is going to get serious if you don't do it right. Lessons from Cameo. Don't claim to be someone you're not. God gave you your own DNA, your own fingerprint, your own purpose. And don't be like somebody else that you're not. God has given you such a time as this, a purpose, a place, and a plan. And you carry it out in your strength that you have. And when you step out in the strength you have, God will pick it up and take it on to the next level. Don't worry about being somebody else. Claiming to be someone or somebody will all become nothing if it's a lie. Verse 36 says that. I think Pat's got that up there. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared claiming to be somebody. 
and about 400 men rallied to him, and he was killed. All these followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. Solomon said, I've done everything, I've had everything, and it's all useless. It all became nothing. So don't do things without God or it leads to death. 